like everyone doesn't know you already, but uh, Courtney put added this question, so I better ask it. Um, who, who, uh, who you want to tell people who you are and what you do? Yep. Uh, so my name is Kyle Bryant, and uh, I am the director of Ride Ataxia for the Friedrich Ataxia Research Alliance. And um, I also do a lot of outreach and public speaking and stuff for the organization. And I go to a lot of little, um, not little, I go to a lot of grassroots fundraisers and, um, you know, I travel a lot and I go around and basically say thank you to folks for what they do for supporting research. And so, um, part of my job is to be grateful, and I think that's pretty amazing. Um, I'm, gra I'm grateful for that. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Uh, can you tell us a bit about a um, bit about your story? And I mean, like uh, a lot of people already know it, but. For those who don't, uh, maybe you want to just tell us your story and a bit about the attacks in. Yeah. Um, so would it be all right if I shared a few slides? My my, uh, my story will yeah. take yeah, about 10 minutes. Sure. That's fine. Go all right. Cool. Sure. I'm going to share my screen here. All right. So when I was young, like most of you, I traveled along like all happy kids and I was genuinely happy. I had Sorry, lots of uh, friends. Kyle, we don't see or I don't see anything. I don't know about anyone. Yep. The, the first slide is blank. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was genuinely happy. I had lots of friends and plenty of sports and activities to keep me busy. It seemed like nothing was standing in the way of my perfect low key life. Restore school, low stress work, retirement age 65, 72, something like that. And um, I had no extraordinary plans, no reason to push myself. Then, I hit a roadblock. At age 17, I was diagnosed with Friedrich's ataxia. And at the time we we're going, Friedrich's ataxia, what the heck is that? We could hardly pronounce it, let alone know what it was going to mean for our family for the rest of our lives. Well, over the next few years, my family and I found out that Friedrich's ataxia, as you all probably know, the rare neuromuscular disease that affects all muscle coordination from the toes to the fingertips. We found out that it would only be a matter of time before I'm in a wheelchair. It would only be a matter of time before I lose all ability to take care of myself. And it would only be a matter of time before I likely die a premature death due to heart disease caused by FA. Now, I don't know about you, but in my book, it's kind of a bummer. And to make matters worse, at the time, there was very little hope for a treatment or cure. So I lived with those facts for a few years, and I graduated high school. I went on to get a degree in civil engineering from UC Davis, where near where I lived at the time, and I got a good job at an engineering firm in Sacramento, California. All the while, I was losing the ability to perform in sports I love, sports like baseball, basketball, golf, and skiing. Well, when it came time for me to give up my upright bicycle, I put my foot down. I said, that's enough. That's enough 
of losing all these sports and activities that mean so much to me. I started writing. Or I, in order to keep cycling, I found a recumbent tricycle. And my first thought was, hold on, gotta get these slides to change here. Tricycle, it's kind of lame. Tricycles are for clowns and little kids. But I was up against this roadblock. This situation in life had thrown my way, and this was my opportunity to react. So I went for a test ride, and as I was rolling around in the parking lot, I absolutely fell in love with the freedom that came with this new machine. This is a freedom I hadn't felt in years. I started riding. My first ride was seven miles. Seven miles, I was so proud of myself, I had no idea I had that in me. My next ride was 14 miles, then 25, then 50. Then only four months after my very first ride, I went for a century ride. A hundred miles in a day. What was I thinking? Well, once again, I was up against the roadblock. The situation in my life had thrown my way, and this was my opportunity to react. Well, I was the last one on the road that day. All the other riders had packed up their bikes and were driving home by the time I crossed the finish line. But I had done it 100 miles in a day. Are you kidding me? I can't even walk down the street and I just rode 100 miles in a day. From then on, the sky was the limit. I started to get confused. I decided that I wanted to ride my trike. The meeting of the National Ataxia Foundation. Well, that year, the meeting was in Memphis, Tennessee. And I lived in California. What a crazy idea. But once again, I was up against this roadblock. This situation in life had thrown my way, and this was my opportunity to react. Well, in January 20, excuse me, so my dad and I left from San Diego, California. We were going to ride our bikes to Memphis, Tennessee. 2,500 miles. And 59 days later, we rode by Graceland. We rode our bikes to Elvis's house. Talk about all shook up. We couldn't believe what we'd done. And over the next few years, my family and I made several more journeys. We rode from Sacramento to Las Vegas and from um, Portland to Seattle all for the National Ataxia Foundation annual meeting. And in those three rides, we raised a total of $360,000 for ataxia research. And we knew we were on to something. But at the same time, I always needed, I always need something for me, some big goal to drive myself toward. So, in 2010, I put together a team for the world's toughest bike race, Race Across America. So, Race Across America, it's, oh, first of all, so, obviously, I'm the guy sitting down there, and then Sean is on the left, Mike is in the middle, or excuse me, John is in the middle, and Mike is on the right. Sean on the left has FA just like I do. Um, but at the time he was still walking, or actually he still he still is walking, but at the time he was still riding an upright bike. So race across America is literally ocean to ocean. So it's a 59-day or excuse me. No, it took us. Eight days. So, so good this. 
you wake up at 2 a.m. after two and a half hours sleep, and first of all, you try and remember where you are. Then you get up, you scarf some peanut butter and jelly sandwich for fuel, and you ride like mad in the rain, in the dark, somewhere in Indiana. But as you can imagine, it wasn't peanut butter and jelly that drove our team across the country. It was purpose. And about a week before the race, I got an email from somebody I didn't know. Dear Kyle, I wanted to let you know that one month ago today, my 12-year-old daughter, Natalie, was diagnosed with that day. I look online and I can't find much hope. But every time I see your team, it gives me hope. Thank you for making this mother realize that it's not too late to find a cure for my sweet baby. And this was the picture that was attached to that email. So I, I showed that map with all those little dots on it and all those were time stations. And we had to check in at time stations. There were 52 of them along the route. We had to check in at each one to show the race organizers knew we weren't just like taking a cab across country. So I pull into a time station about 100 miles from the finish line. And it was day eight and I was tired, sore, and crabby. And immediately I saw Jack his tiny walker and his little leg braces. I started feeling sorry for him. I was feeling sorry for the fact that Jack had to deal with F.A. at such a young age. But then he came up to me. He looked me in the eye with pride and confidence. And he said, hi, I'm Jack. I have a track too. And your team has inspired me to ride five miles in my neighborhood for FA research this summer. And that blew us away. 20, a 3,000 mile ride. And what was one of the most significant things was this little 10 year old boy seizing his opportunity to react to his situation and inspire others around him. So on Father's Day, it was actually yesterday, 11 years ago, in 2010, Team Farah crossed the finish line of Race Across America, 1.15 a.m. We were 19 hours ahead of the cutoff line, cutoff time, and we were first in our division. Um, there, there were only two teams in our division, just to be clear about that. But... Um, not only was it an incredible personal accomplishment for me, but it was an accomplishment for the entire FA community. As you all know, community is really what drives all of us and what keeps us going. And most of these people came out on the route to visit us and to drive us across the country. And it was really incredible to see what, um, to see what we can do when we're supported by all of our friends. Just a second, I'm sorry, let me, let me close this door so we're not getting the pounding in the background. Just one sec, I'm really sorry. There we go. Maybe that's a little better. All right. Can you still hear me? Yep. All right, cool. So uh, in 2009, I came on staff at the Friedrichs Taxi Research Alliance. 
And we built a nationwide series of bike rides. And now we have six locations. And these are our dates for 2021. And um, so I'd love for anyone to come on and ride with us and, and check it out if you'd like. These are just a few photos from the rides and just all the incredible community that comes out and hangs out with us at the rides. Um, so I wanted to, oh, I wanted to <laughs> share this slide as well. Um, Mark, you asked about the movie. So anyone that wants to check out the movie, it's about our journey in Race Across America. And um, you can check that out at thehxmovie.com. You can check out my book on the Amazon. It's called Shifting into High Gear. And then I also recommend checking out the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. We do a weekly podcast and we also do live shows. So every once in a while, you'll find a, a live broadcast where we talk to patients from other communities about their experiences. So um, that is, that's my story. I'm happy to entertain questions, but just kind of wanted to give a little baseline for, for everybody there. So. Right. Um, Thanks, Mark. Yeah, just a few questions before uh, we go to everyone else. So maybe tell us a bit more about what Farah is and uh, what uh, what the future hold or what your plans are for uh, growing that in the future. Yeah. So you know, I I am a small part of Farah. Um, you know, I am very fulfilled to play my role in the community. Um, but there's a lot to Farah. Farah is mainly focused on research. Um, and so I think we fund about $8 million of research every year. And we've got a research pipeline that's, um, got a bunch of different projects in different areas looking at different ways to attack FA in, and bring it to a halt and maybe even reverse it. Um, so, you know, we've got things that um, go after mitochondrial function because we all know, and that's something for all ataxias as well affects mitochondrial function so if we can increase that that'd be great and we also have some gene therapies in the pipeline as well a little farther down the road that we're looking at and um so our a lot of our funding historically has come from grassroots fundraisers so you know it's really the community that is driving the research and providing the funds. And so I think it's been a, a really amazing thing to be involved with when we know that we are the ones driving the research and for ourselves and for lots of other people in the community. Right. Um, there are a few people uh, here, I think we have, uh, we mostly have Canadians that are uh, here, no one else from other countries that I can see. But uh, can people participate in ride a taxi if they're not the, in the USA? Yeah, so we have the global challenge. That's one thing I did not have on my little slide there. Um, the global challenge, though, is a virtual challenge that we will do this year. We did it last year and we're going to do it again this year. I think it's going to end up being an annual thing. Um, this year, it'll go from September 28th to October 10th. And um, anyone can join and um, participate in that. And it's a virtual challenge with different 
different challenges like each day that um, contribute on social media. And then we track, we track our miles on an app called Strava. Um, and you don't have to ride a bike or trike to be able to contribute the miles either. So we have a little conversion that basically any activity you do, 10 minutes equals one mile. And we track our miles and, um, and contribute to that together as a community. So yeah, anyone can join the Global Challenge September 28th through October 10th. Um, so what do you think has been the biggest factor um, as far as Farah's success goes? I think um, the biggest factor is our founding principle and our founding board of directors and um, just the people that put it together very intelligently. Um, you know, our first of all, our founding principle is collaboration. Anyone that has a good idea about um, how to get rid of FA, you know, is is people are people we want to talk to. Um, I also think that our founding board had a really had had really deep insight into making sure the fundamentals were taken care of. Like, for example, one of the first things Farrah did back in the day was build a patient registry where we have all the patients sign up and they can be notified when there's a clinical trial or uh, anything new. And, you know, that's not a treatment or a cure, but, you know, 20 years later, it's our most valuable asset in the journey towards a treatment and a cure. So, you know, pharma companies can um, let us know. We, we help recruit trials in a matter of minutes and days rather than weeks and months and years because we've got this, um, this tool that was started 20 years ago. We also have our natural history study and they started that 20 years ago as well. And there's all kinds of data in there. Um, I mean, I've been in that study for a good 15 years because it was set up. And so I think really it's just a lot of it is our principles and our foresight for what needs to be done, taking care of the fundamentals so we can move forward. Um, what inspired you to do the podcast? So um, I told everybody about the movie, the Taxian movie, and I encourage everybody to, to watch that. You can get it for like three bucks and rent it for a couple of days, um, or you can buy it for like 10 bucks or something like that. And so I, me and Sean were watching the movie and we're like, all right, there's principles in this movie that we need to talk about on a regular basis. And maybe even other people might find value in hearing our thoughts. And so that's really what, what made us um, kind of look at doing a podcast and geez, we've been doing it for five years now and we really enjoy it. Um, we're starting to do like, like I said, live events and stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's great that you uh, decided to do that. I know um, I'm just starting my own now, but it's something that I talked about for a couple of years, but it's like, or thought about at least. And uh, I mean, I hate listening to myself speak, right? 
Because it's like yeah. with with video editing and whatever audio editing, you have to, of course, sit down and listen to yourself, right? And yeah. that's it's just horrible. And it's like torturous. Yeah, I, you know, I think Sean and I have gotten used to it. And, yeah. you know, our, our egos are probably a lot bigger than yours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know um but but i really think that um mark you have a lot of value to give to the world and i think that's really what we focus on is that we think we have some value and and that really supersedes any apprehensive that comes on our end like right. you know and when we started the podcast we're like you know what if if three other people enjoy listening to these conversations like it's worth it you know it's a ton of work as you know but but you know it's rewarding to see that people are interested in what we're saying and stuff like that and it it's like you said before uh the message that you're trying to share is more important than your own personal feeling. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So get over yourself, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, mine, mine's coming out in like two weeks. So yeah, I'm working on it. And not, it'll yeah. get easier as, you know, yeah. as time goes on. Um, yeah. So uh, what advice would you give to an, someone with a taxi that wants to get involved in uh, endurance sports? Well, for me, you know, the, the huge game changer was the instant I sat down on my trike. Um, I saw, I finally saw a possibility instead of just all this negative energy coming at me um you know i could move forward under my own power without a wobble and i think that feeling has never gone away how crazy is that that geez my first i first sat down on the trike in like 2005 and in all that time almost 20 years that amazing feeling of being able to move under my own power has never gone away. And I get excited like every single time I sit down and turn the crank. So, um, you know, I think the key is to find something that works for you. Maybe a recumbent trike is not the thing for you. It doesn't, it doesn't work with your abilities or with your lifestyle. That's fine. But to find the thing that you love to do and that that works in your life, um, I think is the most important thing. It seems so fundamental, but for me, it was a game changer. Yeah, right. I actually, my first podcast episode is uh, with this lady. She's got Parkinson's and she has one arm, right? And she still goes high, uh, hiking and kayaking, does all this stuff, right? And she just adapts it all. Like if she doesn't, for whatever reason, uh, prosthetics don't make sense, her husband just throws her on his back and carries her. Wow, yeah, yeah. that's amazing. I it's mean, it's just awesome what people do when they find what they love. like. We had this kid on the podcast, you know, I say kid because he was like 23 years old or something, but um, he has autism and he's got a career as an Elvis impersonator. Like, <laughs> and it was a really fun conversation, but, you know, it's just a totally random thing, but he loves it. He loves to be on stage and he said, you know, if I'm on stage as Aaron, his name's Aaron Smith. He's like, if I'm on stage as Aaron, like I'm really not like that's not okay. But 
if I'm Elvis on stage, then, you know, I can entertain like crazy. So anyway, you know, it's just about finding that thing. And for him, obviously, it wasn't recumbent cycling, but, um, you know, it was just something he loved to do. Right. We had uh, an interview a while ago with a, a great um, young man who is from New Zealand who has CP. Mm -hmm. And he is, he sings in a punk rock band out there. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Another like diverse choice of, of some to get you going. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so I think I saw on the previous screen at Kyle A. Bryant. Is that where everyone can find you on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram? So that one will work for Instagram and Twitter. And then just look on my name. I think on Facebook is probably the easiest way. Right. And I'm probably already friends with a lot of you or a lot of your friends. So hopefully it won't be hard to find. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So thanks a lot for being here and thanks for taking the time. I'm going to uh, unmute. I'm going to unmute everyone. Hopefully, it doesn't turn into a circus. But uh, going to unmute everyone, and um, uh, we will go ahead and take some questions. As as you're doing that, I just wanted to say how awesome it is that there's 25 people on here. Yeah. Um, well, and they're, John, they're all they're all here for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, John, I yeah. talked to him and he was on a couple of weeks ago and he's like, yeah, there was like 25, 30 people. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, there, there, are, there are a few uh, people that show up here regularly, but uh, nice. so Amy has her hand, ra hand raised. Maybe you can go ahead, Amy. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kyle, I was wondering, a taxi affects about 150,000 people in the U.S. And I knew Friedrichs is included in that, but I was wondering if you had a specific number. I do know also that it affects typically uh, younger children as well. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, um, I'm this... sorry. Yeah, it's diagnosed in a younger at a younger age. Right. Yeah, the typical onset is between the ages of five and 15. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 17. So obviously there are outliers, you know, younger and older than that. Um, but it affects about one in 50,000 people. So that's about 5,000 people in the US and about 15,000 people worldwide. Um, you know, obviously, give or take, those were kind of the numbers that we're looking at. Uh, Jesse, you have a question? Yeah. Hey, Kyle. I was wondering, what kind of recumbent bike did you start out with? Did you start out with it with the bike that you ride now? What did I, sorry, say, say that one more time. What kind of recumbent bike did you start out with? I, uh, I started out on a ice recumbent trike and um, they're made in England. And now since 2009, I've been riding a cat trike um, okay. and they're it, made in Florida. Yeah, so, is it the folding type? So mine doesn't fold. It's, okay. it's one solid piece of aluminum. Mine okay. does though. I'm a cat. I have a cat bike trail. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cow tribe makes a really good machine. So, yeah. Um, anyone else have questions? Just press the raise hand button. If you can do that. And I'll go ahead and call on you. Uh, Sharala, you have a question? Hi. Hi um, is there Hi. any trikes? Um, great for like sand dirtish places that aren't so compact yeah uh if you look up if you google 
fat tire trikes. Um, you'll you'll get some. You'll you'll find there's one made by Ice. It's called the Ice Full Fat. There's also some cat trikes that are uh, modified by Utah trikes, and they actually turn them into quads, four wheels. And um, those are fat tire trikes as well. And I think those, I haven't tried it, but I think those work a lot better on sand and, uh, and rough terrain and stuff. Okay. Are the fat tires, can you compare, are they double the size of a regular bike? Yeah, they're like double or triple the width of a regular size. I mean, the fat then, tires, they're like balloon kind of tires. Yeah. Are they the same as the beach ones that they have at the, uh, like a, at state beaches or like Huntington and Newport have? Are they that fat? Uh, no, no, not quite that fat. Okay, I was just trying to get a gauge. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, yeah, look, look it up on Google. It's they won't be hard to find. Okay. A question, Kyle. So I know some people here might be in the market for a trike. From like, I don't use a trike or anything, but uh, I kind of understand that. You want something with two wheels in the front, is that correct? Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's like you said, there's two types. There's, you know, the two wheels in the front, like the one I ride, it's called a tadpole. Um, and then there's the ones with two wheels in the back, it's called a delta. And um, the tadpoles, the ones with two wheels in front, usually are a lot lower to the ground and so you know makes it does make it a little bit more difficult to get into them but they're much more stable because their um center of gravity is a lot lower i so heard it's maybe, better for cornering yeah exactly i mean really it depends on what you want and i would i would uh you know, talk to a, a shop that deals in tracks to figure out what's right for you. But but generally the the tadpoles with two wheels in front are gonna give you a lot better cornering and stability. Are there sorry Donna I'm, after this question I'll get to you. That's all right. So um um are there specific trike shops or can you just go to any bike shop? Yeah, no, uh, there are trike shops. And so, like, for example, if you go on, um, if you go on catstrike.com, they have, um, you click on dealers and they have a map. All you just like input your zip code and uh, it'll show you the closest shops to your area. Um, Donna, you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, Carl, do you get help getting on your bike? Because um, I I ride a regular trike, the big, the tall ones, and uh, I tried Susan's uh, bike, and I found it difficult to get on and off. Yeah, yeah, it's not easy. You know, a lot. Of a lot of times I, I ride with my dad a lot. And so he helps me. But if I don't have someone, if I don't have anyone around, um, you know, I pull up to like a fence post or a parking sign or whatever it is, something so solid. And, you know, I put my trike right to the left and I'm sitting in my wheelchair and then I pull myself up on the pole and then I swing my butt over and lower myself down. So I've got that solid object in front of me that I can hold on to. Um, otherwise it is, uh, you know, it's almost, it's really hard to get in. Yes. I've got yeah, something solid to hold on to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and actually now I, 
I've been using a, a power chair for um, a year and a half now. And as some of you may know, it's a lot more solid on the ground as far as a stationary object to be able to hold on to. It's a lot more solid than my manual chair. And so that's been helping a lot with transfers into the truck as well. Uh, Jesse? Yeah, have you had any serious wipeouts? <laughs> Sorry, say it again. Have you had any serious wipeouts? Uh, any serious wipeouts? Not yeah. in a while. You know, I am, I'm getting old. You can see the gray in my beard. So <laughs> well, I'm a little more cautious than I used to be. But um, I had a few wipeouts in the beginning of my cycling career you know and um but nothing like too serious i mean i got some road gash on my forearms and stuff but nothing that really like took me out for a fall season or whatever right um so we ha i'm gonna take one more question and then we'll let paul go uh david go ahead <laughs> I forgot my question. I'm so afraid I was going to get my head. When, when, when you do you go out solo on your bike? I do, but when I go out solo, I stay on the bike trail. If I'm going to go on the road, I really try it. I don't go on the road without having at least one the one other person with me just for safety. Um, but I do go out solo a lot because I live right on a back trail, so I can basically get right yeah. on there and go. If, if, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing a power scooter is what I ride around on. And my main concern, even with what I was thinking about with your idea of the recumbent is, what do you do for bike repairs? I mean, I've ridden enough bicycle to know that you need to repair them. You yeah, tires, yeah. You get flats. It's, true. it's so, even, you know, I've been trying to do as much of my own maintenance as possible these days because right now, I don't know if anyone's been to a bike shop lately, but like everything takes like three times as long as it used to, even repairs and stuff. So I've been trying to do my own a lot also um with the trike there's really only a few things like very few things that are are different than a regular bike so really i can take my trike into any bike shop and they'll be able to, to fix it you know all the components are the same so yeah. i think what well, david well, is asking is if you're yeah. out on a ride and your trike breaks down. Ah, that's what I was asking. I carry my doing, phone. How, how, <laughs> how are you yeah. doing your own roadside repairs? Yeah, when there, they break there, 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 like, there's a company called Veloflex, which is a Canadian company. They're, they're now all over the US and Canada. It's V E L O F I X. It's a mobile tire bike company, and I use them. And I mm. don't have to take my trike. I have a, a Delta, a Sun trike. So everybody should look into that Bello, Bello fix. Yeah. Yeah, but like if I'm out on a ride by myself, and you know it would take forever for a friend to get to me or whatever you know i do carry spare tubes and stuff mm -hmm. so i transfer mm -hmm. onto the ground i sit my butt down you do, right? and you know and i turn my trike on the side right. and i i do what i need to do um and if it's something more serious that i can't fix myself then then i i, I get a or call someone to come help pick me up and take it to a shop. But what you're saying though is you have to sit out 
now that I think about it, when I was riding my two wheeler and with the stupid cleats on, because yeah. they, they didn't allow you to walk anyway, when something happened to the bike, same thing, sit on the curb and drag it to me and make yep, it make exactly. repair. Uh, interesting. It was yeah. one of the things that has stopped me. The other one is storage and the size of a recumbent. Uh, do you store yours outside or do you have a garage? Um, so I, I store mine inside and I, you're right. So I have two trikes that I have, like I ride one on my stationary trainer in the winter and then I ride one outside. And recently I got a little gizmo that I put on my wall and I can hang one of my trikes on the wall so it gets above the floor because, like you said, they're huge, you know, and they get in the way. But so that is a struggle. That's why, you know, sometimes it's nice to have folding ones. Um, we, we yeah. are, how wide is your trike? Is it, is it narrow enough that it can go through an interior doorway? Are you... Yeah, yeah, it's about 28 inches or, yeah, about 28 inches. So it fits through most doors. Yeah. Um, anyways, Kyle, we've had you here for almost an hour. So I'm sure you're busy with a lot of stuff. And uh, um, actually, uh, yeah, we'll let you go right here. And uh, yeah. And uh, if anyone wants to contact you, they can reach you at Kyle A. Bryant on Twitter and Instagram. And I think you're Kyle Bryant on Facebook, right? Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Great. Cool. Well, thanks so, so much for having me. And um, I hope to see a lot of you in person sometime soon. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.